The changes to making a more energy efficient home are actually not that big and they're no. definitely not that expensive, but it is a change and there's a sort of conservative nature to the construction industry, which I totally get. I mean, as a builder, you know, everything you build is a potential you know, lawsuit in the waiting. And really, I understand that. But I think when those builders are finally forced to do something by regulation, they all do. Welcome to Facing Future. Our guests today are Chris Magwood, who's with the Carbon Free Buildings team at the Rocky Mountain Institute. His latest book is Build Beyond Zero, New Ideas for Carbon Smart Architecture. Lloyd Alter is an architect, developer, and former design editor at treehugger.com. He now teaches sustainable design at Toronto Metropolitan University and is a contributor to the Green Building Advisor. He's the author of Living the 1.5 Degree Lifestyle, Why Individual Climate Action Matters More Than Ever. And today my co-host is my co-editor at Facing Future and former cameraman and editor covering international news for a major TV network in the UK, the ITV. He has designed and built two energy efficient houses and he now lives in one of them in the Isle of Skye in Scotland. Welcome to you all. Buildings have a huge carbon footprint from the materials and the energy used in construction and from the emissions once the building is inhabited. But houses can actually sequester carbon, use less damaging materials in their construction, and require less energy to heat and cool. I'm really excited to hear about your work. Chris, can you start us? Sure. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, the, the notion of buildings as you know, sites of carbon storage is is pretty recent and uh, to me really exciting because I think for a long time uh, we've we've thought about our role in the building industry as kind of doing less harm you know use less energy make less emissions and but but always kind of framed in, in that like reduction of of the bad. And when we start thinking about buildings as sites of carbon storage, we start to be able to think of buildings as like being more good instead of less bad. Um, so that, you know, you, you, there's the potential for a building to actually, the climate is in better shape after I make the building than it was before I started because I've mm. taken a whole bunch of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and in various ways, you know, packed it into this building in the form of different materials and and to me, that's that's really exciting. That notion that you know we can be more uh, thinking about our role as restorative instead of just uh, minimizing impacts. Mm -hmm. Lloyd, you write a lot about um, architecture. What yeah. are you excited about? Well, I'm like, like Chris, who's been actually an inspiration in a lot of this discussion about um, upfront and embodied carbon. You know, I've been around long enough to see the changes over the years that 50 years ago, when the environmental movement started, we were all worried about energy, 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 and operating carbon. And it dominated the whole picture. The carbon footprint of building something was a fraction of the energy that was used to keep us warm and to run our lights and everything. And what's happened is that we cranked up the efficiency, the overall pie of all the energy from building and operating a house got smaller. And the upfront carbon emissions from building it uh, became a bigger proportion of that smaller pie to where as we electrify everything and say have heat pumps and that it becomes almost a hundred percent of the emissions where I live in Ontario, Canada, where our electricity is really clean from nuclear and hydro. Um, really it's almost a hundred percent of the emissions if I have a heat pump and run on all electricity. So we have to worry about this way more than we ever did before. The other thing, you know, I like to think of it not just as upfront emissions and operating emissions, but now emissions and later emissions. That what we're doing now goes into the atmosphere now and counts against that carbon ceiling that we have to stay under to keep below 1.5 degrees. So basically, everything we do now matters significantly. And for years, we had it wrong. I want to pass it back to Chris. 
because he was such an inspiration about 10 years ago when he talked in a book, I think, The Carbon Elephant in the Room, that was the first person to really clearly say, hey, we've got to look at what is going into our buildings, what materials we're using. Yeah, and I think what happened there was I saw um, a, a discussion developing early on as people started to look at the carbon footprint of materials. It, it, it almost immediately started to turn into this, well, you know, you could either do a good job on the embodied carbon or you could do a good job on operating carbon, but somehow that those two things were, you know, in competition with each other or two different directions that you could take to look at the carbon footprint of a building. And my background is in building with straw bale and other natural materials. And as I was looking at the carbon footprint of materials, I realized, oh, there's this whole pool of materials, some of which are kind of alternative, but some of which are, are also like well embedded in the home building world that actually store carbon. And a lot of those are insulation materials. And so it seemed really apparent that you could be doing both. You could be you know, adding insulation to the house, making it more airtight and doing all of these things to really reduce the operating emissions while not only not driving the, the embodied emissions up, but actually, you know, storing carbon at the same time. And so there's this opportunity for this really great win-win where you make the building more efficient and you do it using these carbon storing materials. And, you know, you, you beat that, that threshold that Lloyd was talking about of like the now emissions. If you can make the now emissions zero or even less than zero, you're really helping us stay under that, that limit today. But, you're not doing that at the expense of operating emissions that are going to add up over time. And that just seemed, you know, to me as a builder, like exciting to think that, that there was, um, you know, people talk a lot about win-wins, but you don't often come across them where they really right. are, you know, uh, a pair of big wins like that. And so, you know, that's been what's kind of exciting and, and motivating me over the last decade. Passive houses have in, typically used a lot of concrete. I know um, the one that Mike has designed did use a lot of concrete, um, but there are new forms of concrete. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that, Mike? Well, I was about to say, I, in, uh, in, in the light of what Chris has been saying, I mean, I do have to make a confession that the two houses that I have built, and I'm just an amateur, I'm not professional anyway, like, like the two guests are here, but in both cases, I went for a high mass design. So there is actually quite a lot of concrete in this house. Previous one, there was also, um, although that, because that was in the English Midlands, we had access to a greater variety of building materials. And though we perhaps weren't uh, as environmentally clean as the designs that Chris is working on and, and has worked on, we actually did our best. We were able to source concrete, which had waste products from blast furnaces in it rather than freshly quarried aggregate. We have, um, well, actually it's the same in this house, the, the insulation in the walls is uh, spun from fibers made from recycled glass bottles. So you can, you can still do quite a lot, but because my original inspiration, because I retired early from my job in television news and, and decided I wanted to do something that might help everybody else as well as helping me. And, and the inspiration I had was a house built in the 1990s in Nottinghamshire in England by an architect couple called Brenda and Robert Vale. And that was, well, it wasn't perfect, but it was as good as they could get it with the knowledge that they had and the materials that were available at the time. And that was high thermal mass, but it was very well insulated. It also had a dry composting toilet system and a whole house rainwater harvesting system. So it didn't, the only external service it was connected to was electricity. So because I was new at this, when I started out on this journey, and I thought, oh, this is what I want to do. So I, I basically based my house on Brenda and Robert Vale's house. Um, and as a result, it actually attracted a huge amount of attention, which was quite good in a way. So even if we weren't perfect in our approach to it, we actually, I don't know if we actually converted people, but a lot of people were interested. A lot of people came to look at the house and said, wow, we didn't realize you could do that. We didn't realize that you could actually build a house that doesn't need a heating system. That You can actually tread very lightly on the planet. I mean, maybe I could have tread even more lightly, but we, you know, as I say, I did my best. So it was, it was a worthwhile project. I, I now see, and I'm aware of the, the changes in emphasis on building materials and that you can build in a more environmentally benign way than perhaps I did. Nothing is ever simple, is it though, really? I mean, the houses I've built will last an incredibly long time because they're stone and concrete and so forth. Um, and then there's obviously a payback because neither house has a heating system. You're, you're obviously working at very, very low 
um, operational running costs, very low operational carbon emissions. So after a while, you do buy back some of the embodied carbon that went into constructing the building. So it is a slightly different approach to what Chris has been outlining. But as I say, I, I started knowing almost nothing and I did my best. It is certainly building using very, very environmentally benign materials from the outset is obviously a very good way to do it, a very good approach. Uh, may I ask, because I'm really curious, you're up in the Isle of Skye, which is, if it was in the same latitude in Canada, would be like in the Northwest Territories or the middle of Hudson Bay. And I see your big windows and I see your black floor in that. But like, how do you get through the winter without uh, another source of heat? I mean, there's not going to be enough sun to go into your thermal mass, is there? Like, how do you get through the winter? Well, we've just got through our second winter in the house. Um, we're, we're actually using the same principles as Brendan Robert Vale. Yes, there's, there's, that, that is, well, south is over there. So this yeah. very large area of, of glazing is, is facing almost due south. Um, you do get some solar gain. You do get some sunshine. For people not familiar with the phrase, it's the solar gain. It's the same thing that makes your car blazing hot when you park it in the sun in the middle of summer and keeps your greenhouse warm. So the house, in a sense, acts like a greenhouse. The floor below these slate tiles is concrete. So if we can get that floor warm, it actually stays warm for some considerable time. This is where, again, I'm talking about it. This, is, this is a high environmental impact build because the walls are concrete, but the walls are made of six inch thick concrete blocks. So we store heat in all that lot. The house is super insulated. It has a mechanical ventilation system. All of these things are fairly standard in, in very low energy builds. But in fact, I, I did tell a slight white lie when I said we didn't have a heating system. We do have a mechanical ventilation system with heat recovery, and it does actually have a heat pump in it, which oh, can okay. boost the amount of <laughs> warmth coming into the house in very cold periods. But when I say heat pump, it's not one of these massive, great big things that you see vaulted to the walls outside houses. The heat pump is about that size. It's about the size of the heat pump that you would have in a domestic refrigerator. And it right. consumes four to 500 watts and puts about two kilowatts of heat into the house through its coefficient of performance. And it's been on quite a lot of the winter, but not all the time. We haven't needed anything more than that. Well, you, you, might, be able, you might be able to see it just over there on the floor. There is a 1950s one bar electric fire. It's a one kilowatt electric fire. And on just a few evenings, when maybe we sit down and watch television or whatever, so you're not terribly active, we've, we've switched that on for about half an hour to an hour, just very, very occasionally. Otherwise, the house has performed superbly well. I mean, two days ago, we had a very, very cold night, but it was a, a bright, sunny day either side of it. And I was sitting at the table behind me, having my breakfast with just a T-shirt on um, and looking out at a really, really hard frost in a house that at that point the heat pump compressor wasn't even running. And I was just thinking, this is incredible that I can do this. The problem is, of course, that you really did use a lot of uh, concrete uh, to create that house. I mean, it, the the original footprint is from the construction. Uh, I think Chris is doing a lot of things yes, that, yeah. that are designed to not have uh, all that kind of uh, impact. Chris, how yeah. does your process differ from what Mike is doing? Sure. I mean, I would say the last thing that I want to do, and and I feel like this sometimes happens when I'm talking to people, is is I'm not you know going to be a, a material shamer. You know, um, <laughs> there there's a there's a, a development of of how we approach houses, and I think you know my own practice went through something very similar, where the energy conservation was the core you know uh, thing that we were trying to achieve, and so. You know, that's I, I, I made a lot of houses just like the one Mike is in, you know, really well insulated, uh, very airtight and and not paying attention to the, the carbon footprint of the materials because that ha that wasn't a thing when, you know, uh, that that I or anybody else was looking at. And so I think I would never say, oh, Mike, you made a bad house because you did this thing <laughs> like we didn't know we weren't paying attention. And, and there's no you know, there's nothing wrong with that, I would say as I've started to, to shift the, the approach to building design, it's like those principles are all still there. Like, you know, uh, thermal, you know, solar gain through the windows, thermal mass in the building, those are still important things. But now I would go about achieving them with things like a rammed earth floor instead of a concrete floor, earth blocks or Duracell blocks you know, in place of the concrete blocks. There are uh, a whole range of different materials instead of the spun glass fiber insulation 
sheep's wool or straw or hemp insulation. So you end up building a house that anybody looking in would see, oh, this is this is the same house as that house. You know, a lot of the, the materiality kind of is invisible and disappears and, and is in service of the same outcomes. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the carbon footprint uh, difference is really dramatic. And, you know, it's, it's only a few years into people, you know, even starting to, to hear that message and to think about it. So there's absolutely no shame in, in having built a house with a lot of concrete. You, you yeah. set out to do something and you did it really well and it met all of the goals you had set when you did it. And that's all we can do. And if we've now added this new goal of how do you do all of that, plus have a low carbon footprint, then you start to switch things up. But I think it's, you know, I, it, it's not, uh, it's not that anybody did anything wrong before. It's just, we know something new now and we can uh, kind of like steer the ship in a, in a slightly different direction. I would say, if you don't mind, in, in my defense, we had some idea at the design stage what we were doing. Some of the decisions were dictated by the fact that on the Isle of Skye, it's quite difficult to get what you might call even a remotely alternative building material. So whereas in the previous house, we used the um, heavy concrete blocks, which contained ash from blast furnaces instead of recycled aggregate, we, we didn't have those options here. We had to kind of go with what was available. They're actually the default um, building system out throughout most of the highlands is, is timber frame. But the recycled glass fiber insulation was chosen because it had the best U value of any insulation that we could get hold of. We did actually look at sheep's wool and we looked at some other, what you might call slightly more eco um, insulation materials, and, and they didn't have the performance that NALF dry therm, which is what we used, um, actually has. And another thing is the outside of the house is, is clad in stone, but it's relatively local stone. It was quarried not too far away. And we avoided using um, fired clay roof tiles. And I understand fired clay in bricks or roof tiles is a fairly high carbon material to use. So we avoided those. So although we were a long way from the sort of standard that you're achieving, it wasn't done in total ignorance. We, we, we kind of did try yeah. to, do, to do our best, yeah. You shouldn't use the, you know, to reiterate what Chris said, you don't have to say in my defense, it's a great house and you had good <laughs> reasons for doing what you did. We all make no, well, uh, these you. choices. Uh, Chris used an interesting word, materiality. And it's interesting because I'm just finishing up my next book, which is called Carbon Upfront. And in it, all of the chapters are based on words. And I have a whole chapter called materiality, where I talk about the choice of materials. And the next chapter after it is jokingly called edibility. You know, can we make buildings out of that they're almost edible? I joked when I first saw Archetypes Enterprise Center, this thatch covered uh, school that they built at the University of East Anglia, that if you looked at the palette of materials they used, straw, thatch, cane, you could basically chop it up, add milk and eat it for breakfast. It was at least a cow could. And uh, all of these materials were natural and almost edible and therefore did what Chris talks about actually store carbon. They also brought back work. They trained Thatchers to do this giant building and brought back a whole industry where people are doing this again now based on the training. And it's in a lot of ways, I believe, the direction that we have to go. Um, concrete is a serious problem from, again, the upfront carbon emissions that come out. Webb Yates, Steve Webb, the engineer, he's been doing what you're talking about, about stone. He's been proposing that stone that's local has almost no carbon footprint, that there's just the excavation and it doesn't take a whole lot of area compared to even trees and what you would do building out of wood. And he's been proposing that stone cladding like you're talking about and stone foundations you know you dig a hole put in a base have a stone pier and he's shown that it's the lowest carbon high mass foundation that you can do have you looked at that at all stone foundations chris is it something you've given yeah i remember to? so i did a book a while ago called making better buildings and and it, it was sort of divided by sections of the of the building and i put stone foundations in there and and the editor was like you know, you suggest a lot of kooky things, but I think that's going too far. Like stone, <laughs> who's going to make a stone foundation now? But like, honestly, rocks, 
they're great. You know, like the, <laughs> there they are. They're formed, they're load bearing. They do all the things we want to do for all the reasons you said. Yeah, I think where you have access to that stone and uh, obviously, you know, where Mike is, that that was a resource that was there. I think it's hard to beat stone for all kinds of reasons, but, you know, durability and low carbon footprint uh, are high among them. And it's beautiful, or potentially. Yeah. I mean, it's quite striking, the exterior of this house. I mean, everyone comments on it. Yeah. So it's quite a nice thing. It's not essential for low energy buildings to be beautiful, but why shouldn't they be? Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. Um, Chris, one of the things I, I read in, in your work was about um, biological architecture, which uh, Lloyd has been talking about. Um, there was something called mycelium uh, on straw that you can actually kind of grow this insulation. How viable is that? Uh, it's really viable. And I think, and I feel that, you know, the next few years, we're going to see a real explosion in, in mycelium composite materials because it, it really is um, exciting in a way that almost nothing else I've ever seen in my career is exciting. People have been making it into insulation materials for a few years now. Nothing is completely commercially available, but there are some companies getting really close to that. So as any kind of material, the, the whole notion with mycelium is a, it's a different paradigm than anything we've done before. Like typically, whether we're talking stone or trees or straw, like somehow we're like going out into the world and we're like getting a bunch of stuff and and then taking it somewhere and processing it. Maybe not very much, maybe a lot, but but that's what we do. We go out into the world, get stuff, bring it back. With mycelium, mycelium is the root structure of mushrooms, uh, incredibly fast growing, incredibly strong. Uh, if you look at it under a microscope, you know, it's a it's an engineer's dream in terms of like how all of those fibers kind of like, you know, uh, connect and twist and link together. And you can grow this in indoors in lab conditions. Um, the insulation we grew on the on the straw panels, you know, in it grew in four days, we put down the the, uh, the inoculated uh, straw, we added water and a couple of tablespoons of flour, covered it up for four days, pulled the cover off, and there was an inch and a half of, you know, an insulation with, a, with an R value as good as plastic foam insulation. So, you know, among the, the highest insulative values possible, and it grew there, like nobody, there was no factory, there was no machines. And so, you know, seeing what people are starting to do with that now, there's a, a company in the US, uh, Occamworks, they figured out how to grow it structurally. So they're literally able to grow the equivalent of a two by four in four days. So again, instead of going out to the forest and chopping down the tree, you grow, you know, the two by four uh, in the, you know, in the factory, making it into flooring, wall tiles, like all kinds of things. And I think uh, between that and people also starting to grow algae-based cement and microbe-based cement, like all of these things where we're now thinking, oh, hey, nature does that already. Like, how do we actually put these nature-based processes into action? It's a huge paradigm shift for the construction industry. You know, if you can think about it, that the, the industry shifting away from this sort of resource extraction base to, um, to a, a sort of grow base, um, and, you know, the, the microbes grow stone, the algae grows cement, the mycelium grows, you know, mushrooms and two by fours. It's, it's, a, it's a really exciting shift and, and hopefully uh, really, you know, starts to revolutionize the, the, whole, the whole construction industry. With the concrete, it's particularly interesting. When you look at what is the main ingredient of concrete, it's limestone. What is limestone? Seashells. And so, you know, what they're doing with the biological concrete is like just skipping the whole, let's make carbon car calcium carbonate out of seashells and let's go back to the biological process that made it in the first place and just grow the calcium oxide. And it's fantastic because, you know, we didn't need to go through a million years of getting seashells and crunching them into limestone. We just grow the concrete. And if we can grow the walls out of mycelium and we can grow the foundations and the concrete out of uh, algae, we've got a different world. Yeah. And then the raw material for those is, is carbon from the atmosphere. You know, yes, that's, exactly. <laughs> that's, you know, what we need to do right now is get a whole bunch of CO2 out of the atmosphere. And if we can do that by, you know, incorporating these biological processes where that is the food, you know, the, the feedstock for the algae, for the microbes, for the mycelium is atmospheric carbon, then, you know, we can build machines that suck CO2 out of the atmosphere and 
that might be great too. But if we can, you know, use these natural processes that already use that as a feedstock and turn them into useful materials and products, you know, yeah, I think that's right, Lloyd. It is sort of a, a new world. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's better, isn't it, to avoid putting the CO2 into the atmosphere in the first place uh, yes. rather than trying to suck it out later. You know, don't, yeah. don't spill the sugar on the carpet. Uh, you, then you won't need to get the vacuum cleaner out. I mean, that's the principle, <laughs> yeah. isn't it, really? I, it's very impressive. I, I think it's really great that so many extremely low energy houses are being built. I think some of the technology that's going into it is very impressive, and it's great to see the results. But I always have this worry that we're not going to make a significant difference unless the major property developers change their ways, and their ways are to build as many nasty little cheap houses as they possibly can for the maximum profit. And that doesn't really lend itself towards building in innovative low energy dwellings. We had a case um, in the UK where the, there's a lot of, well, there's a, a relatively small number of extremely large mass building um, companies. We call them noddy box builders here. It's sort of meant to be mildly insulting, um, but they have enormous power. And we, we had a relatively innovative scheme to improve housing back in 2010s called the Code for Sustainable Homes. But the big property developers didn't like it. They said, um, we can't make enough money. If you want us to build houses like this, we can't make enough money. It's too expensive. They went to the government that they're very close to, and they said, we want you to scrap Code for Sustainable Homes. And they did. They said, oh, As yeah, David yeah, Cameron we'll said, get rid of all the green crap. Get rid of all the green crap. <laughs> this was actually um, the then Chancellor George Osborne. Yeah. who bowed to the wishes of the mega property developers. And um, he basically said, all right, yeah, I'll scrap it and I'll hand it over to you. And, and so, in effect, they decided what the building uh, standards are going to be. We call them building regulations here. I know they're called building code elsewhere. But it, we, every country has the same basic set of guidelines for, for building quality. So, and, and until we can overcome that sort of power based on wealth and influence, I can't see us making really significant progress towards reducing the building emissions of housing stock throughout the world. Well, I've got, I, I'm going to jump in and just go off here because this is something I feel very strongly about that if you want to solve our problems of energy consumption, you shouldn't be looking at the building codes. You should be looking at the zoning bylaws. That basically, you know, it's a function of we're building the wrong thing in the first place. I mean, in the Isle of Sky, a single family house makes a great deal of sense. But if you're where the population is, you have to look at what they do, say, in Vienna. In Vienna, when they want to open up new development land for suburbs, nobody's in a single family house. There's an English architect who said, you should never build anything less than two stories and you should never build anything higher than five stories because in that space in between, you can say stick frame or use all of these interesting technologies. As soon as you go over five stories, you're into either concrete or mass timber, which uses up four times as much wood as building lower buildings. And as soon as you start building low density, then you're forced to build roads and garages and deal with cars. So it's all one thing. You can't separate transportation from buildings. It's built environment emissions that we're dealing with. So the first thing with all of those stupid builders who are complaining is that they have to stop being allowed to build single family houses per period. To build passive house in a multifamily dwelling where you're sharing your floors and your ceilings and half your walls and you've only got one exterior surface to deal with, it's really easy to get very low energy. And if you keep them below five stories, you can build really nice housing where everybody has access to grade fairly easily. And you can solve many of these problems. Those developers, you know, are in the land business more than the house business. They're taking cornfields and they're upgrading them to houses. They, they make most of their money, I understand, from the planning permission that they get to build. Exactly. Exactly. The That's where the money is. Yeah. The money is in upgrading cornfields to houses, not in actually building the houses where they subcontract almost everything out. And then they try to do it as cheaply as possible to maximize their gain. And that's where you run into the problem. Uh, the lesson in what we should be doing, I think, is really in the suburbs of Vienna and Munich, and Munich, where they're doing great stuff compared to what I see in the UK. Yeah, that standard of housing here is terrible. Oh. Genuinely dreadful, yes. 
I think there's been there's been a real like uh, false uh, link between building quality and especially energy efficiency and cost. I mean, there there are enough examples now of really excellent production style housing that meets really high energy standards. I, I'm thinking of you know here in Ontario, Canada, Doug Terry Homes. He made a commitment 10 years ago that everything he built as a standard production builder was going to be net zero ready or like already net zero. And he just did. And the company's doing great. And the people like his houses and he's able to make a profit. What I think large builders don't like is change. Um, and often they'll use price as the as the way to stop change from happening. But, you know, the, the changes to making a more energy efficient home are actually not that big and they're no. definitely not that expensive, but it is a change. And there's a sort of conservative nature to the construction industry, which I totally get. I mean, as a builder, you know, everything you build is a potential you know, lawsuit in the waiting. And really, I understand that. But I think when those builders are finally forced to do something by regulation, they all do. I mean, there was no energy code 25 years ago. And the very first step towards more energy efficient homes, every builder is like, no, 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 can't do that. Can't do that. I mean, and then the, the code goes through and ta-da, everybody's still in business and they're still making their homes and they're still making money. I think, you know, it, it does take, I think, some bold politicians to just say, yeah, you know what, like this, <laughs> this is what we need to do. And, uh, all the builders will figure out how to do it. They're smart. They're innovative. They've been, you know, figuring out how to make money in this really difficult business for a long time. And they'll figure out how to do it when it's, you know, zero energy homes. They'll figure out how to do it when it's zero embodied carbon homes. Um, it's a clever, clever bunch of people. They just, you know, don't want to have to change. But but when the changes come, everybody adapts and figures them out. Let's take a very simple thing in the UK where houses are notoriously leaky and no one ever has heard of a blower door. There are no standards for air infiltration. It's completely ignored. I've been talking to a couple of people about this as do you do a blower door test? What's that? Literally. And, you know, this is now standard. That's in our codes now, isn't it, Chris, that you've got to do a blower door on a new house? Not in yet. some places, yeah. In some places, but this is one reason and the houses are so bad. You know, 40% of your heat loss is through air infiltration. And the wind just blows through English houses, new and old. Uh, and it's just crazy. And the cavity walls that they've got, you can't check insulation. You can't fix insulation. It's basically technology that's 100 years out of date. If something no, was wrong and you did have. a blower test, you'd never find it. I know. I know you have it. You mentioned it. <laughs> I mean, the, the Isle of Skye is quite a good place to build a, a, a passive house, which is extremely airtight, because we get some ferocious weather here on occasion. Yeah. We get um, uh, kind of wind-driven rain that's probably like being in a car wash, lashing against the side of the house, and, and really, really strong gusts of wind and so forth. But inside the house, it's calm, it's quiet. There are no drills because we've got a good airtightness result. And how it, often do you lose your electricity because of those storms? A passive house like you're in is a thermal battery. Your electricity can go up for a week and you won't notice it in the temperature drawing. This is why every building should be like this. You, you won't get cold, but we do yeah. lose power sometimes because we're at the end of a lot of very, very long cables. Yeah. We had a two or three hour outage just the other evening. But I'm fortunate enough in having an electric car which has a vehicle to load facility. So for those two, three hours, we ran the house on the car. The car which is fat. This is the future. It electricity. And, and so I just plugged it into the house. So we, we mm. sat on television, uh, you know, went, yeah. went to bed. Everything was perfectly normal. The next morning I switched I, back on domains and, and, and absolutely no problems. I had this question yesterday from someone, you know, when I was doing a lecture. They said, if we go all electric with electric houses, how will we get enough electricity? And I said, no, it all works together. You design your house properly to reduce the demand so much. Your car battery can be storing electricity at night and giving it back in peak hours and everything works together. And you've just given a shining example of that passive house plus electric car equals resilience. Yes, and, and people sort of think, oh, well, lots more houses are going to use lots more electricity. But the point is that these highly energy efficient houses use a, a, a tiny amount of the electricity of, of a conventional dwelling. Yes. So you have more of them, you actually end up reducing the overall power load in, in time. 
people are amazed when they discover how little I'm paying for electricity. And it's not right. because I'm stealing it, it's because I'm hardly using any. Well, it sounds like the major hurdle is in regulation and in, in terms of scaling this up and making it uh, the, the common way of building. Uh, we need to look at politics, as always, uh, and see, you know, in the United States, in the UK, in Canada, you know, can we get new kinds of building codes in, in sufficient time to, before, you know, our climate collapses? The real estate sector uses some 40% is is contributing 40% of the emissions. So it's a huge question. It's really important. And um, I want to thank you all for appearing today on Facing Future. Uh, you've been wonderful guests. And thank you very much. Yeah, thank thanks you. for the opportunity. It's a so pleasure. Thank you.